I'd like to welcome Peter to the stage. Hello, uh, like you said, my name is Peter Ibarra. I'm a data analyst at Distillery, which is a company based in New York. Um, and our paper was through the business of sports track, and what we're gonna talk about today is using digital media signals to measure, to measure audiences' brand engagement, more specifically with the sponsors, at major sporting events, and for the 2015 Major League Baseball season. So, what that, like, as we all know, the types of audiences and develop audience profiles, but we can understand their online behavior and really start to track some of the engagements that they're having with the corporate sponsors, like through the teams themselves. So who is Distillery? Distillery is in, uh, first and foremost, a technology and data science company. And part of our core business is working with corporate brands to both develop and execute their digital media strategies. And this can come from a variety of ways. One of the big ones that we do is through online desktop campaigns. So as you're browsing the internet, you're looking on web pages, you see the advertisements that appear up on the side of the pages. That's an example of like a desktop opportunity, bidding opportunity that we are there to help execute for these brands. That same philosophy can also be applied to the mobile world. So if you're using your mobile device or your tablet, for whether it's what we also can do is location information. So as part of standard like uh, mobile bidding opportunities, a lot of the times with the user's permissions, lat and latitude and longitudinal data is shared, with that is shared with that bid stream opportunity, and we can see that and start using that location information to execute the brand strategies that we talked about earlier. Now because of this being our core business, we really have access to a lot of the online behaviors that people have across desktop, mobile, and the physical world through these location insights. So what we wanted to do is how can we start using these data streams, these data sets that we have for opportunities outside of our core business, and we felt that this was an opportunity to do that. By using the location information as our primary data set, we, feel that we, we felt we could have started to see the users that are showing up at Major League Games to develop audiences for each of the teams. So what we do is, within each of these things, we can collect that data, and as part of collecting the data, one of the main things that we want to ensure is that it's clean and representative of the people there. So there are many filters in place that we have to ensure that it's clean data, but we're gonna go through four today. The first is what you see on the screen here. It's a geofence filter. And what that means is that for each location, we set a centroid, and we develop a custom radius to be built around that centroid. So what this is doing here is we see the centroid in the stadium and we build that custom radius to capture the area that the stadium represents and the people that are visiting that area itself. So depending on the stadium, because we did this for each one, I built a custom, basically a custom, uh, a custom radius for each stadium depending on where they're at. So if it's in a high urban environment, we would want to have that tighter radius to ensure that we're not getting the noise that can come from outside the area. So what you see here is actually City Field, which is like near the, you know, the subway stops. We don't want to capture any of that noise, which is why you see that very tight radius. But there are other places that have, you know, like parking lots where people can maybe go tailgate, where we would expand that out. But it really is appearing in the physical world. But as part of kind of the industry, there is an incentive to provide that information, although not make that information always accurate. So we want to ensure that the information we are getting is accurate. So when we study the large data set and all these billions of data points, we can actually pick up on patterns within that data itself and start to filter out those things as suspicious activity. As an example, if we started to see 50 to 100 devices appearing in one specific location. So like if they're all in that one dot, there's no way a person can be, or 50 people can be in that one location. We can see that type of behavior happening and actually exclude it from the data set. Not only the, not only the people that are providing that information, but the devices themselves. The third thing that we have is the behavioral filter, or something called the Superman effect. 
And this is more device specific. So if a device is showing a bidding opportunity in one location, like in California, and then a very short time frame, that same device is showing a bidding opportunity coming from New York, we know that that's not possible unless you were actually Superman and could like, take travel time, travel faster than the speed of sound. So we can see these types of unusual behaviors and mark that device to exclude it from our data set. And lastly, and probably the most important filter that we have in place for this specific study is the time filter. We didn't want to just mark these locations and pick up anybody that's coming to the, within that area. We wanted to ensure that it was happening as a game was incurring. So each device that we saw throughout the 2015 season was while a game was happening. And you can see that up on the thing. But at the end of the season, we then know, after all these filters have been in place, that it's a data set representative of people at the game and being on their devices while at the game. So some of the, some of the brief characteristics that we saw is depending on the stadium, we saw anywhere from 250 to 300 unique devices per game. On top of that, um, when looking at the whole data set itself, as much as 30% of the audience that we saw was a device that showed up one time and didn't come back the rest of the year, which we actually find to be interesting and we'll get to a little bit later on. We have. And how we do that is through something called a probabilistic device graph, or what we call the crosswalk. And it's using the device that you're using like, at a stadium, so in most cases it's a mobile device. Through the device graph, we can actually infer what other devices you're using outside the stadium to connect to the digital world. Whether that be a tablet or desktop, we can see that information and start to collect that data to really understand the full online behavioral profile of who these fans are because how you, are, how you interact with the digital world at the stadium is gonna be different than how you do it elsewhere. And we wanna be able to capture that and really have a full, rich data set to understand the audience profiles that we're having. So when, we, when we've done this, when we've collected all this stuff and we've then crosswalked that information to the other devices that they use, we can now start to analyze the behaviors that they're exhibiting while they're online. And that's what this is doing here. So we have this huge data set of all the online content that they visited. We now need to rank and score each individual piece of content. So what we do is we'll say, okay, Seattle Mariners fan base, what was the probability that a person within that fan base is gonna visit HuffingtonPost.com? We can determine that probability and then compare that probability to the general population's probability of visiting the same exact piece of content. And that gives us our index. So then we can, after, after doing that, uh, after doing that equation, we can then essentially say that fan base is half as likely, twice as likely, five times as likely as visiting these pieces of content. And we can do that for each individual piece of URL, or, we've, or we can do it a different way. At Distiller, we do something called the um, crafted audience segments. And what these are is we've devised a way of describing a collection of URL visits into a description or a type of audience. So if as a user, you're visiting MLB.com, Baseball Perspective, Baseball Perspectives, and the team's website. We can see those congregations of uh, websites that you're visiting and say, okay, that's probably a baseball type of audience, and we can then measure you against that as well. So now we're gonna get into the exciting stuff here of how these audiences are now interacting with, their online, with the online world, and what are the audiences that are popping up? So one of the exciting things here is, for both the San Francisco Giants and the Minnesota Twins fan base, we can see, okay, they're obviously they're, they're sports fans. We can see that. Major League Baseball is at the top for the Giants. But the, it's what other sports are they interested in when they're not looking at baseball? And we can see two different things here. With the Giants, they're NBA fans. Maybe they're really starting to get into the Golden State Warriors. I mean, I've heard they're pretty good. So we can see that stuff start to come up. But for the Twins fan base, when they're not interacting with baseball, they're with the NCAA and NFL. Those are the separate fan interests. But we can go beyond just understanding that they're sports fans and we can start seeing who and what they're interested in. So looking at the Giants, we can see that they're tech savvy, they're ad agency professionals, they're in market for luxury retail, which kind of makes sense because they're near the Silicon Valley. So intuitively we can say, yeah, that, that is making up part of who their fan base is. On the other side, we see something even more interesting. When you look at things like retail women's fitness, retail jewelry and watches, retail yoga, what we're trying to, what, what we can probably say is that the audience profiles that are, that are popping up for there, six of 12, as much as 50% of them are coming, 
are likely being driven by a female consumer. These are the types of insights that having the data to back the information up can really bring voice to who these fan bases are and who's constituting those fan bases. But as we can see, there are clear distinct differences here, with location probably being the primary reason that we're seeing some of these differences. However, looking at the information, we see that location isn't the only factor. Taking a step away from Major League Baseball, we're looking here at the location, which was the uh, Dover, Delaware speed track. Distinct audiences coming out of them. And what, the important thing here is it's not just that it's happening at that raceway, but it's what type of events are going on while people are attending that location. So we can see from the NASCAR and then the two music festivals, like I said, three distinct audiences that are representative of the people that are there. And the important thing is understanding that our data set is able to show those distinctions. So NASCAR, they're obviously into a lot of the racing, racing individual contents. Firefly and Music Festival, they're both music festivals, but even then we see some differences. With the Firefly, a lot of .edu's suggesting a younger audience, but we're also seeing other music festivals that they want to go into which is different than the Big Barrel Country Music Festival. We're seeing their other interests, whether it's hunting or fishing. Um, and what you can also see some brands start to show up as well, Dogfish, Wings to Go, that these are maybe the types of brands that that fan base, or that audience, excuse me, is going to consume when they're not at these festivals. And that's the exciting part of what we started to see. And when we do that, we can then start to understand that it's not only location, there's a variety of factors that go into building these audiences and these fan bases. We can now look at these and say, okay, what are some of the things that they, like, what are some of the important things that stand out for the Royals fans? Who are they and what do they care about? And we can see that they're working parents, they have good credit. Those are like some of the definitions that can help define that fan base. But we can go beyond and say, what are their interests? They're grill masters, they're moviegoers, they're home design enthusiasts. And we're starting to really delve deep into understanding how these people are interacting with the digital media world and behaving while they're online. And we can take that information and really like, kind of uh, understand the nuances of what makes up that fan base. So when we did this, we, we understood that we could do the audience profiles across all the teams. But like we said before, we can go beyond just the, the whole profiles and start to understand the types of fans within each fan base. Looking at the Chicago Cubs here, like I said before, around 30% of an audience only showed up one time. Well, we start to see some distinctions when we break out the casual fan from the avid fan. So the people that showed up three or more times, we classified as avid. The, the, the fans that showed up one or two, we classified as casual. We can see some distinctions there as well when we start looking at the individual content itself. So looking at the older audience, we can, we can infer that they're probably more affluent, that they have more money to spend, but also they're invested very much in the team. They're not going to these games multiple times because they want to, not only for the good time, but because they're invested in the team itself and really want to be a part of the entire season experience. When you compare that to the casual fan, it's a little bit different. What we see is that these games that they're attending, like yes, they may have an interest in the teams themselves, but when you compare that they're also looking at other entertainment sites, they're looking for other things to go out and do, that maybe what these fans are doing is not necessarily going to, to watch the game for the team, but going out to have an entertaining time, to go, see and under, to go see and do something fun. And we can start to pick that stuff out, and it's important when it comes to marketing, because how you wanna, under, how you wanna market to these fan bases is very different, and they also have distinct interest. Having the data to understand what drives those types of fans will really help sell the sponsorships that teams want to go after. So now that we say that we have all the, we have all the profiles, we have all the people of what we, uh, of, for each team, we can now begin to rank and compare them to one another. By doing that, we can go and work with marketers directly and say, as an automotive marketer, I'm interested in sponsoring a team. Can you tell me the top five places that I should go to bring my sponsorship dollars to? And the exciting thing is that we can and we can back that up with direct information because what we're saying here is not that they're interested in cars, we're saying that they're currently in market for a car. And that's why you should go after these, these specific areas because they're the top five for that, for that interest. So Detroit kind of ma makes sense, it's, you know, it's car town, it makes sense.
but maybe some of the other places are places that they wouldn't normally think about, but that by having a data-driven approach, we can bring that to the forefront and show them the value that that has. Same thing with, with the fans' interest. If there's a technology company out there that feels that they, the people they want to go after, they want them to be tech savvy. We can do the same thing here as well. We see the Silicon Valley come up again with the Giants and the A's, but we see also DC, Los Angeles, and Seattle. We see other places that they can go after and really capture that market opportunity. So now that we've done, we can work with the marketers themselves, but not only that, we can go to teams and help teams start to understand the fan base and who that fan base is made of. So when we look at the teams, like the teams here, we can start to see, okay, when we understand who the, like the Yankees fan base is, we see they're currently in market for sporting goods, for sportswear. They should match up with Models Or Detroit, they're do-it-yourselfers. Home Depot could be a good match for you guys. We can do this across the board for all, for all the teams within Major League Baseball and try to help sell them, sell who their fan bases are and develop the types of partnerships and relationships that they should be developing that will bring value, not only for the brands, but for the teams. And that's an important thing that our data does. And while all of this, we can build the audiences, we can understand their profiles, and we can help create some of these relationships or develop some of these relationships, it doesn't mean anything if there isn't a way by which we can understand the value that that brings. And our data actually allows for a measurement system, a quantitative measurement system, by which we can see, is the sponsorship having an impact on these, on these fan bases? And what we're seeing here is that when we look at the sponsorships as the season progresses, so these are the three months of July, August, and September, we're gonna go back to the indexes that we talked about earlier, and we're gonna say, okay, as time goes on, the, the indexes are increasing for each team. So we're not saying that they're visiting it more, we're saying that more people within that fan base are starting to engage with the sponsors that have partnered with these teams. And we can say, look, look at the impact that your team sponsorship dollars are having for your brand. And that's a big, that's a big impact for not only the teams themselves, Last thing I'll end with here is just pointing this out real quick. In the last five years, we've seen sports revenue from, from sponsorships, whether it's the league as a whole or teams individually, has grown exponentially. We've seen as much as 30% of, uh, of an increase in spend. And what we want to say is that we think our research can help you spend those dollars in a smarter way. And also, the, other, the, the thing I'll end with is like we develop these insights by using, a core, uh, by using products from our core business, data sets from our core business that are outside the sports world. Imagine what we could do, imagine the value that Distillery could bring if we were able to partner directly with the teams and the corporate sponsors that partner with the teams. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. I'm Dan Altman from North Yard Analytics. Could you go back to the slide with NASCAR and the music festivals? Sure. Right, so I was looking at the Firefly Music Festival there, and I, mm -hmm. I, I noticed the colleges, as you pointed out. And I was just thinking, well, how many people went to the Vermont News at University of Vermont website? You know, maybe three at, at, at the time at that festival? I mean, how many, would I really expect that there were that many Vermont people there and they all went to that website? So I, I'm trying to get a sense for the sample size here. And so, it seems like it might be pretty small on that one. So for these individual events, um, they, were, they were a smaller sample set. Uh, when compared to Major League, and this is the point of what we wanted to make here is that while they are smaller and that the indexes are gonna be a little bit, there's gonna be more variance within that, the emphasis that I wanted to make was that our, our data can kind of show the differences between those. Um, there still is value because while we are only sampling a small proportion of it, we still are getting a large amount of data behind that when it comes to those, who those people are. Um, but when we go back to like, kind of like the main emphasis is through Major League Baseball itself, is like over the course of a, of a long period of time, we can really start to validate a lot of the things that we're seeing. But this is kind of to show like, yes, there are, there is some variance, but it's to show like the events is gonna have an impact on the types of things that they're seeing. Because we didn't see those websites also show up in the other areas, even though they were all three smaller data sets. Hi, 
Hi. Hello. Um, thank you. Um, my question is about, you said you had 250 to 300 unique data sets per game. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think it would be if you had access to the teams? Would it, is it basically like 90% of the people there? And then secondly, how are you currently getting this data? I, I know you said you have some of your own tools. Can you just uh, um, elaborate a little bit about what's happening and how, is it just a geography filter and then you're just running that on the set you have? So the, where the location information is obtained is um, if you've ever like, been using your phone, like if, it, if an app ever asks, can we use your location information, when a user accepts that, accepts that it's, uh, what it's allowing the, what the app to use is when it, when it has an advertising opportunity show up within the app. So if you're playing a game and there's an app, that, is part, that opportunity is sent out for uh, essentially for like an automated bidding process. And when that happens, the lat latitudinal and longitudinal data that the device is allowed to share is passed along through that bidding opportunity. So what we see is that when we're trying to, when we're looking at that online, that mobile inventory, um, there's a percentage of what we see that is having that information with it. So that's how we're kind of able to see like where the devices are showing up within the physical world. Does that make sense? I'd like to thank Peter uh, for the presentation. And give him one more round of applause. Thank you.